Turn to Isaiah chapter 37, and, uh, or 36, excuse me, and we'll be covering chapters 36 through 39. And this section will finish off the first major segment of Isaiah. Obviously, we're, uh, we're more than halfway through the book, and uh, I think I said at the very beginning of our studies in Isaiah that the book divides not down the middle, but nonetheless into two very reasonable easy to identify sections. So different are these sections from each other that some scholars have felt that they must have been written by different men. I don't agree with that suggestion at all. I believe that the same man wrote the whole book of Isaiah and Jesus quoted from both portions of the book and identified the author of both portions as Isaiah. So the critical scholars who uh, say that uh, you know Isaiah in the days of Hezekiah wrote the first 39 chapters but that the rest of the book was written by someone else whom they Deb as Deutero Isaiah, uh, that belief is not in accord with Jesus Christ's own opinion. And we, as Christians, tend to side with Jesus on issues, uh, especially against critical scholars. So uh, we will not be even entertaining the notion that chapters 40 through 66 may have been written by somebody other than Isaiah. Nonetheless, they are clearly a different kind of material, and many uh, of the most conservative uh, students of Isaiah are willing to admit that they may have been written at a different time in Isaiah's life. Uh, certainly the mood is different. In the first 39 chapters, it's mainly prophecies about judgment, as you've probably seen. As we've gone through, it's almost all judgment. Some of it gets a bit monotonous. Uh, all the repetitious talk about judgment coming on different nations. In chapters 40 through 66, however, that's largely promises of deliverance and promises of peace and references to the golden age and the Messiah and things like that. It's a very different kind of material. Uh, but to finish up this first segment and bring us up to chapter 39, we have four chapters, that is chapters 36 through 39, which are historical. Everything up to this point has been prophetic. There have been a few uh, rare insertions of history, principally at chapter 7 and 8, which took place at the time of Ahaz. And the major focus of the prophecies up in this first section are having to do with the threat of Assyria. As you, again, probably noticed as we've gone through, even though we've had some breaks in our studies in Isaiah, you probably have noticed there's a continuity of thought there that uh, it is Assyria who is menacing Judah throughout the first 39 chapters. But when you get past that mark and get into chapter 40, uh, mostly the conflicts and problems with Babylon are in view. Now, the problems with Babylon did not arise in Isaiah's lifetime. They arose much later, over a hundred years later. And that's one, another reason why the critical scholars don't believe Isaiah wrote the latter part of the book, because it's too accurate uh, to be writing about things that would happen after Isaiah's day. They don't believe in the reality of predictive prophecy, and so they just assume that those chapters which talk about the threat of Babylon could not have been written as early as Isaiah's time, but we do believe in predictive prophecy and we believe Isaiah wrote all the chapters. But the interesting thing about that is that we are now at the transition point between the two sections. Everything before this transition is talking about the period where Assyria was the problem. Everything after this will talk about the period where Babylon is the problem and Assyria is no longer in view. And these four chapters of history sort of make a logical transition between the two thoughts because the first two of these chapters uh, deal with the problems with Assyria, whereas the second two bring into the picture the problems in the future with Babylon. So this four chapters of history, uh, of history which is a, an interlude really in the book, will be a transition between our focus on Assyria to our focus on Babylon. And in chapters 36 and 37, we have the story of how the Assyrians came against Hezekiah. Now, in my comments on different prophetic portions that we've already covered, I've alluded to and even told this story on several different occasions of how that Assyria came against Jerusalem and Hezekiah was being told by some of his counselors to seek help from Egypt and Isaiah was telling him to do the opposite. Finally, he did obey Isaiah and obey the Lord he just put his case in God's hands and God brought deliverance. That's what chapters 36 and 37 record. The same information is recorded also in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. Uh, it's 2 Kings chapter 18 and 2 Chronicles chapter 32. We have this story. 
And for the most part, the story is told in practically the same words in 2 Kings 18 as it is in, these, in the chapters before us. There are a few differences, but, and we will go through it. Uh, but of course, you're going to go through the same material when you go through it in Kings, so you'll get this more than once. Chapter 36 begins, Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of the king Hezekiah that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. <coughs> now, at this point, Second Kings inserts three verses that are not uh, in Isaiah. Second Kings 18 at this point, verses 14 through 17, I think, or through 16, 2 Kings 18, verses 14 through 16, insert here the fact that Hezekiah sent a message to Sennacherib uh, seeking to buy him off, uh, saying, whatever you want me to do, I'll pay you, just leave us alone. And so Sennacherib said, well, send me X amount of money, and Hezekiah sent the money, but uh, Sennacherib double-crossed him and took the money and, and came up against Jerusalem anyway. Now, that information is in 2 Kings, but not here. And we simply read in, in verse 2, And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto king Hezekiah with a great army and stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, Lachish was one of the cities of Judah that Sennacherib was at this time making war with. And Lachish would not last very long against Sennacherib. Sennacherib was far more powerful. But uh, apparently Sennacherib felt like he didn't need his whole army there to conquer Lachish. So while he was fighting against Lachish, he sent one of his chief uh, military men, uh, Rabshakeh, and that is not a name but a title. Uh, it's not a man's proper name. And we're told in Second Kings he sent a couple of other people named Tartan and Rabseris, which are probably also titles rather than names. And they came from Lachish, where Sennacherib and his armies were fighting, they came with a great army up to Jerusalem. So in other words, Sennacherib was fighting two fronts at the same time. He felt like he could take care of Lachish with only a portion of his army, so he sent a, a huge portion of his army up to besiege Jerusalem. And uh, they came and stood outside Jerusalem. And uh, so Hezekiah sent some, an envoy out to talk to them, uh, some diplomats. Their names were, in verse 3, Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. Now, they sent along a, a recorder to write down the conversation. And these two men went out as uh, emissaries of King Hezekiah to try to work out some peaceful situation, which they were unsuccessful in doing. Now, you might remember the names Eliakim and Shebna because they were mentioned in an earlier chapter. It was chapter 22, I believe. And there was a prophecy against Shebna and uh, saying that Shebna, who, ha who was over the house, and that meant he had a very high position in the government. Uh, he was like the steward of the king's house. Uh, it was in chapter 22 of Isaiah, verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say... And then he gives a rebuke of Shebna and tells him he's going to die and not... Uh, not maintain his high office there. But then in verse 20 of Isaiah 22, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle and so forth. In other words, the prophecy in Isaiah 22 is that God was displeased with Shebna, was going to demote him and eventually he'd die and be buried outside of Jerusalem. And he would be replaced in his office by this Eliakim. Now, when we come to this chapter 36, we find that this apparently has happened. Because when the prophecy was made in chapter 22, Shebna was over the king's house. But now we find in Isaiah 36, 3, Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, was over the house. He had Shebna's old job. Shebna apparently still had some kind of position. He was now just a scribe. But uh, he had been demoted, and Eliakim had been promoted into his office. And these were the men that were sent out to meet with Rabshakeh and Rabsaris and Tartan. Verse 4, And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now unto Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust, that thou rebellest against me? Now, he says, Who are you trusting? 
to save yourselves against the king of Assyria. He goes on to rebuke them for trusting in Egypt. Now, that's the same thing Isaiah had rebuked them for. Isaiah was telling them not to trust in Egypt, and Rabshakeh, though, of course, he had no idea what Isaiah had said, he says the same thing. Of course, he's coming from a different position. He's trying to intimidate them into giving up, and he doesn't want them to have any hope that Egypt will help them because that might make them hold out longer against his, against his uh, invasion. So he's just trying to demoralize them, and he speaks words that are intended to intimidate, as you'll see. He says uh, in verse 5, I say, uh, we read that, verse 6, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lead, it will go into his, lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to him are all that trust in him. In other words, it's like a man who's leaning down on a, a bamboo shooter, a reed that he thinks will hold him, but he doesn't realize there's an incipient crack, and when he leans on it, it breaks and cuts him. He says, that's what it's like to lean on Pharaoh. You think he's going to support you, but you'll just hurt yourself trusting in him. But if thou say to me, we trust in Jehovah our God, Rabshakeh says, is it not he whose high places, whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship, bef not, uh, ye, ye shall worship before this altar? Now here Rabshakeh shows his ignorance of the Jewish religion. The kings before Hezekiah had set up high places and altars in the places where the Canaanites had formerly worshipped the false gods. This was forbidden by God for them to do, but they did it anyway. Hezekiah had been a reformer, and he tore down those high places. He's one of the few kings who ever actually went so far in his reformation. He and Josiah were the only two kings in Judah's history that went so far as to tear down those high places. Rabshakeh uh, didn't understand. He thought ever, all those high places were dedicated to Jehovah, and he had heard somehow that Hezekiah had ordered all those high places destroyed, and he thought that basically Hezekiah was rebelling against Jehovah and that he was desecrating the high places and places of worship of Jehovah. So Rabshakeh didn't understand the situation, but he was saying, you people don't, don't think that you're going to trust in Jehovah. After all, after your king has insulted Jehovah by pulling down those high places. And then he says in verse 8, Now therefore give pledges, I say thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders on them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? And am I now come up without Jehovah against this land to destroy it? Jehovah said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So what he's saying is, uh, don't trust in Jehovah. Jehovah sent me to destroy you, so Jehovah's not on your side. When he says, uh, make pledges or give pledges to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able to set riders upon them, He's either taunting them, suggesting that they don't have as many as 2,000 men among them that could ride a horse, or else he's probably more likely saying, listen, join with me and uh, you can become part of my army. Uh, you, you know, we've got 2,000 extra horses here. They probably lost that many riders in the war. And, uh, and he says, if you've got some riders, you can join with us and take over the world with us, essentially. Basically trying to allure them to, to surrender and throw in their lot with him. But uh, then it says in verse 11, Then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joah and Rabshakeh, these emissaries from the city of Jerusalem, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and speak not to us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. In other words, the Jews were requesting that the guy would stop speaking Hebrew. He was making these statements in Hebrew so that the people on the wall who all gathered around to see what was happening uh, could hear and uh, these ambassadors didn't want the people on the wall to hear what he's saying, lest they become intimidated by what he's saying. And so they said, speak to us in Syrian, that's better, that we can understand that, and that way the people on the wall won't know what you're saying. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Jehovah, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. This is the kind of thing that he's saying they shouldn't believe if Hezekiah is trying to encourage the people to resist. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. 
and eat ye every one of his vine and every one of his fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, Jehovah will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim the son of Hilkiah that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes torn, and told the words of Rabshakeh. Now, when they said, please don't speak in the Jews' language because we don't want the people on the wall to be intimidated, he says, uh, he says, well, in fact, he says, I want them to be intimidated for one thing. After all, the decision you make about this matter will affect them too. They're going to have to eat their own dung and drink their own piss just like you are, he says, if you, don't, if you don't give in to me. And what he's referring to there, of course, is that whenever a city was under siege, they couldn't, the people couldn't go out and farm their lands and, and harvest their crops, so there was always uh, a necessity to live on the food that was stored in the city and if the siege went a long time people would begin to starve and they actually would begin to eat their own dung and drink their piss for lack of fresh water and uh, so he's basically saying you know uh, how dare you po politicians you know try to negotiate behind the back of your people when they're going to suffer for your decision if you don't submit to me uh, you're not the only ones who are going to be eating your dung your people on the wall are going to be eating theirs too they ought to be able to hear what I'm saying and they ought to be able to make their own decision is what he's saying. And so he gets up and starts shouting to the people on the wall and says, don't let Hezekiah persuade you. Don't let him say the Lord's going to deliver you. He says, which of the other gods have delivered their land on my hand? Well, he was quite right. He had conquered all the other la lands around. And every nation, every land in those days had its own tribal god. Of course, we know that they weren't real gods. Only the Jews had the true god. But the belief of that time was that every ethnic group had their own tribal god and so you know to the Phoenicians it was Baal to the Canaanites it was Moloch um, to the uh, Moabites I believe it was Chemosh and there were several other gods of the surrounding territories of the Babylonians it was Bel and Nebo and uh, the, the Persian or the uh, Assyrians themselves had their god was uh, Nisroch which is a, dif uh, a different form of the name Marduk and so these were all different tribal or national deities that, that each nation worshipped their own deity. Now, for the most part, every nation believed in the genuineness of the gods of the other nations. But what they believed was that each of the gods was assigned one nation to be sort of the protector of. And so the people in Phoenicia, though they really believed there was such a god as Nisroch and such a god as, as uh, Molech and such a god as Jehovah, they considered that each of these gods were just tribally associated and that if the Phoenicians needed help, they had to call out to Baal because he was the god of their geographical area. And they assumed that Jehovah, whom they acknowledged was probably a real god, they just thought he was a tribal god of the Jews and a national, uh, regional god, and that, uh, and that he was just like any other gods. And they did definitely believe that if, you know, if, if they were going to fight a war, it would be a war between the gods in, in a very real sense, that the gods would be protecting their own people. So... If the Assyrians came against the Jews, it was like a, a fight between Marduk and Jehovah. And what he's saying is, in all of the conflicts so far, we've won. None of the tribal gods of any of the other nations have been able to withstand us. And what makes you think Jehovah is going to be able to withstand us, is what he's saying now. So he's kind of changed his story. He doesn't speak consistently because he's lying anyway. But first he said that Jehovah had sent him. Now he's talking about Jehovah is not strong enough to stop him. And... Uh, He's just saying things, of course, in order to intimidate the people so that there will be, he's hoping there will be a general revolt within the city and pressure put on Hezekiah to, to surrender. But the people remained loyal to Hezekiah and they, he had told them not to answer, so they just kind of held their peace on the wall, but they were probably pretty scared. And Eliakim and Hilkiah, uh, being unable to negotiate the situation, uh, they went, they tore their clothes, which was a sign of, you know, overt grief, and went back and related the message to King Hezekiah. Chapter 37. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and he went into the house of Jehovah. 
there's an interesting well we'll see this I'll point this out when we get to the end of the chapter but he went into the, the house of Jehovah which was the temple in Jerusalem with his, to his clothing torn and sackcloth put on against his skin which is a way of mourning or showing humility or repentance and he sent Eliakim who was over the household and Shebna the scribe and the elders and the priests covered with sackcloth unto Isaiah the prophet the son of Amos Amos and they said unto him thus saith Hezekiah this day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy for the children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring forth now this is either a metaphor or else it's a literal statement it's either saying that the, the food supplies are so short in the city that people are already uh, famished people are already so weak that, that even women who are bearing their children don't have enough energy to, to you know the, to push the babies out or else he's simply saying this metaphorically saying uh, essentially this is the time for something to happen but we don't have the strength to we don't have any resources we're, we're totally weak in the situation but it says th there to take this message to Isaiah it says Hezekiah says it may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshika whom the king of Assyria ha his master hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord God hath heard wherefore lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. They essentially came to Isaiah not for a message, but just to ask him to pray because the situation was, uh, was a bad one and they figured, well, he's one of the godliest men around and we better get him praying for us. Tell him how bad the situation is. As it turned out, Isaiah gave a message of encouragement. Um, in verse 6, Isaiah said to them, Thus shall you say to your master, meaning King Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Well, it doesn't mention what Hezekiah's response was to Rabshakeh, but it's implied that he resisted Rabshakeh, and he, he took Isaiah's counsel and did not surrender so in verse 8 it says so Rabshika returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish and he heard say concerning Tirhaka king of Ethiopia he has come forth to make war with thee and when he heard it he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying and then he sends this message and he happens to send it apparently by letter but let me just explain what that's saying in verses 8 through uh, uh, 9 Remember that Rabshakeh had left his king Sennacherib fighting in Lachish. And while Rabshakeh was negotiating with these guys in Jerusalem, news came that uh, Sennacherib had left Lachish, probably had defeated it, and now he was moving on to Libna, another city. And in addition to that, he heard that the king of Ethiopia was coming up from the south and very possibly was going to make war with them. So Rabshakeh realized that uh, there might be war on the southern border, and if there was going to be war to the south, he didn't want a hostile Jerusalem to the north. Uh, and so he decided to, use, to strengthen his threats and to seek to intimidate Jerusalem into surrendering quickly so that they could get the, the problem of Jerusalem out of the way and he could concentrate on the battle to the south with the Ethiopians coming up. And it says, here's the message he sent to Hezekiah to try to hasten his surrender. In verse 10, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given to the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my father hath destroyed, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden, which were in Telazar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the cities of city of Sepharvaim, Hena and Iva. In other words, he says, these are all cities I've already conquered. Where are their kings today? You're going to be in the same place if you resist me. Why don't you just surrender? That's what he's saying. Verse 14, And Hezekiah received the letter, this message came by letter, from the hand of the messengers, and he read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. So he just opened the, lo the letter up for God to read. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord. We do this with our bills sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> spread our bills out before the Lord and Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord and said O Lord of hosts God of Israel that dwellest between the cherubims 
Thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which, uh, which, have sent to, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries, and have cast down their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. This is a very fine prayer, actually, and it, and it was a prevailing prayer because the Lord heard it and delivered. Um, but here, he starts by uh, pointing, it starts by praising God and extolling God's great power, saying that God is not just one of the gods of the nations, as, as Rabbi Shekha supposes, but he's the God, even he alone is the God of all the kingdoms of the earth, not just of Jerusalem, but he's the God of all nations. Uh, and it, it says he's the one who made the earth and heaven. Now, of course, God already knew that and didn't need to be told. Uh, part of the value of praise, however, when we extol God's greatness and his virtues, tends to draw us into a clearer perspective of who he is too. As we begin to say, Lord, you made the heavens and the earth. You, you know, stop the waters of the Red Sea and let the children of Israel pass through dry shod. You you know, delivered David from the hand of his enemies or whatever, as you begin to recount the glories and the, and the greatness and the accomplishments of God in the past, it tends to build your own faith as well. And, of course, God, uh, God loves to be praised anyway. He, he deserves to be praised. But there's a certain value to us as well when we begin to recount God's great power. I mean, to say, God, you created the heavens and the earth. When, when we realize that that's true and we remind ourselves that that's true, then to think of some puny army outside of our gates ready to, to wipe us out uh, doesn't sound so scary after all. I mean, the God who made the heavens and the earth is, is with us and we're seeking to honor him. So he says, he basically says, God, listen to these blasphemies and avenge your name. And he does seem to call for help not on the basis that just because they're scared and, they, and that they deserve to be helped or anything, but rather to vindicate God's name. He said in verse 20, Now therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, even you only. His concern is that God might be glorified in all the nations by showing his superiority over the gods of the heathen lands that were already conquered. Verse 21, after this prayer was prayed, then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee, meaning has despised Rabshika and Sennacherib, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. In other words, he says, it's like, he's like saying, Jerusalem may seem to be a young girl merely, someone that can be quickly ravished and raped by the marauding soldiers, but she's not afraid. She thumbs her nose at you, in essence, he's saying. She wags her head. Uh, she defies you. He's basically... He's, he's hurling insults back at this, at this intimidating army. He's saying, uh, he's really essentially saying, I thumb my nose at you. He's essentially saying, or I stick my tongue out at you, kind of a thing. Only he speaks of Jerusalem as the virgin, the daughter of Zion. Now, he doesn't say, the lion of Judah. Or he doesn't say, Ariel, the lion of God, defies you. You know, he speaks of them as a vulnerable uh, child, a female child, who would seem to be weak, of course, against an army, but that's just the point. When they're weak, then they are strong. Uh, when they cease to trust in their own selves, then the strength of the Lord is, is with them. And they see themselves as a defenseless young girl, uh, but because they've got a big daddy holding her hand, uh, they can stick out their tongue at the, at the bullies out, you know, out on the sidewalk. So, in verse 23, he continues reproaching this is again the, the, what Hezekiah is to send a message to Rabshika. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? Even against the Holy One of Israel. By thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots am I come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon. And I will cut down the tall cedars thereof and the choice fir trees thereof. And I will enter into the height of his border and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water. I have sol uh, and with the sole of my feet I dried up all the rivers and besieged 
place of the besieged places. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste defense cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and as the corn blasted before it be grown up. But I know thy abode and thy goings out and thy comings in and thy rage against me because thy rage against me uh, yeah, and thy tumult is come up into mine ears. Therefore will I put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. So this is the message Hezekiah is responding to the threatening letter of, of Rabshakeh. He's saying essentially, we defy you. And we are not afraid to defy you because you have defied the Holy One of Israel. This is very much like what David said to Goliath. You come to me, you know, uh, he says, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Holy One of Israel whom you have defied. Uh, David was confident that since the enemy had defied God, he had not only defied the Jews, it wasn't just a personal quarrel between the Jews and the Philistines, but God had a reason to be offended because they had defied the God of the Jews Therefore, they were quite confident that God would vindicate them and would punish those who blaspheme. So that's the same spirit that Hezekiah has here. Actually, Isaiah is the one putting the words into his mouth to send back. Uh, it essentially says uh, in verse 24 and 25 that the king of Assyria gave himself all the credit for his victories, that he thought that by his multitude, by the multitude of his chariots, by, the, by his power, he had uh, conquered the cities and he had managed to dry up the rivers of the besieged cities meaning that he had managed to conquer the cities by waiting them out and starving them out. But he says in verse 26, Haven't you heard? God predicted that you'd do this. God is just using you as a tool to fulfill his purposes up to this point, uh, to, make, to lay waste defense cities into ruinous heaps. And he says that's why, verse 27, that's why those that you've conquered were of so little power, because God had delivered them into your hand. However, this is not the way it's going to be with Jerusalem. And he says... In verse 28 and 29, God knows all about you. He knows where you live. He's got your number. He knows when you're getting up in the morning, when you're going down. He, uh, he certainly knows how you are defying him. And he's going to put a hook in your nose and take you back the way you came. Now, that's a pretty courageous thing to hurl at the king, uh, at Rabshakeh. I mean, if Hezekiah did not really believe the Lord was going to save him, you might think that he would still want to maintain the possibility of making friends with this guy. <laughs> you know? I mean, after all, the guy had never been defeated yet. The guy had taken every city that he'd ever come against. Jerusalem, uh, as far as natural odds were concerned, had no chance, really, of hoping to resist. And Hezekiah, as the king, if he was ordering the resistance, would be the one who would come up under the wrath of, of Sennacherib, really, ultimately. You know, when a, when a city was conquered, the king would either be put to death or else maybe taken into captivity. And I suppose a defeated king would hope to be taken into captivity rather than executed. But uh, Hezekiah, if he uttered these words to Sennacherib or to Rabshakeh, he was not likely to endear the man to him at all with these kinds of words. And he was, you know, really sticking his neck out because he's, God better save him after he says this kind of stuff. <laughs> After you hurl these insults at the guy, you better hope you got something to back you up. It's like reminds me a lot of the of the uh, Get Smart program, where uh, this isn't very edifying necessarily, but it reminds me of the same principle. It's not unedifying, but uh, you, of course, everyone here has seen that program, Get Smart. But you know how Maxwell Smart, you know, he'd be up against this big uh, seven-foot guy, you know, and and uh, the guys, hurt, you know, coming at him, menacing, and Maxwell Smart say. Stand back, 99. I'll take care of this big hairy ape. And he'd walk up and he'd go, boom, 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 in the guy's stomach. The guy doesn't even flinch. And then Maxwell Smart puts his hand on his shoulder and says, uh, hope, hope you weren't offended by what I said about the big hairy ape. <laughs> if you really throw an insult at a guy's face, you better make sure you've got something to back it up or you're going to be in an embarrassing situation afterwards. And that's what Hezekiah is sort of facing at this point. So this is the message Isaiah said that he should say, should say to uh, Rabshika. And in verse 30, we then have, this is Isaiah's word then to Hezekiah. It doesn't point it out clearly, but it's obvious from the content that verse 30 stops speaking to a, the king of Assyria and starts 
speaking to Hezekiah, and this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit thereof, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward, for out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it, but by the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it from, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So God promises Hezekiah the victory is the Lord's. Uh, there won't be so much as one arrow of the enemy shot into the city. Uh, that's how, how, how bloodless the, the victory is going to be from the Jews' point of view. He gives them this sign, and it reminds us a little bit. In fact, it's very, very similar to the sign that Isaiah gave to Ahaz some couple generations earlier. You remember how Ahaz was surrounded also, and his city was besieged by the Syrians and, the, and, and Israel. And Isaiah said, I'll give you a sign. There's a, the virgin is going to conceive and bring forth a child, and before he is mature enough to know between good and evil, these kings around you will be gone. In other words, within the next couple, three years, you'll hear no more about Israel and Syria. It was the message, that was the sign that God gave to King Ahaz through Isaiah. Well, he's, got a, he's given Hezekiah now a sign in a similar crisis, and it's a similar message. Essentially, he's saying, this year and next year, you're not going to be able to eat uh, crops that you've sown. Probably it is thought that this utterance may have taken place about autumn in the fall uh, and therefore it was too late for them to harvest the crops of that year and because of the siege they, they would not be able to, to they weren't able to plant for the coming year either so for the, the rest of this year and the coming year they would have to eat uh, food that grows by itself because they wouldn't be able to plant however by, by this time next year uh, they'd be able to go out and cultivate and, the, and the, so on the third year following they'd be able to eat their own crops. The idea is uh, within less than a year uh, they'll be back, things will be back to normal, really. And uh, God will bless the Jews again, the remnant anyway. Notice the remnant mentioned in verse 31 and verse 32. The remnant that has escaped from the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. So, it was essentially saying it's not long. There will be a while yet. You're still not going to be able to plant crops next year, but, but uh, you'll be able to the following year. Now, the, it doesn't mean that for another whole year the Assyrians will be there, but rather they'll be there long enough that it'll interfere with the, the planting season uh, for the next year. Then it says in verse 36, the, Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. They woke up dead the next morning. <coughs> no, what it means is when those who survived woke up, there were 185,000 dead corpses among them. And uh, that, remember, he had said, he had sent, uh, in verse 7, he had sent the message, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now we see the fulfillment of that in verses uh, 37 and 38. Now, what happened in verses 37, 38, for instance, is 20 years later than the material we've just read. But Isaiah records it at this point simply to show how the prophecy was ultimately fulfilled. There's a 20-year gap between verses 37 and 38. But, as I said, it's logical to insert verse 38 here to show before we leave this issue that, that the prophecy was fulfilled. And verse 37 says, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Apparently, the loss of the 185,000 soldiers uh, indicated to him he'd better give up this particular campaign. And in verse 38, 20 years later, it came to pass as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch his god that Adramelech and Sherezer his son smote him with the sword and they escaped to the land of, of Armenia and Esarhaddon the son of his son reigned in his stead. So here Sennacherib uh, was slain by his own sons. The irony here is that the chapter begins with the king of Israel, or the king of Judah, going into the house of his God for safety, and his God saved him. 
the chapter ends with the king of Assyria going into the house of his god for safety and he's murdered there. Uh, just the, uh, it seems like an irony intended in the chapter that it starts with Hezekiah in the house of his god and it ends with the king of Assyria in the house of his god. The former is saved by his god. The latter is not saved even from danger in his own land. He wasn't slain by uh, physical swords of his enemies but he was slain, assassinated by his own sons. Okay, thus we have the end of the portion of Isaiah that deals with Assyria. Now, the next two chapters, which are also historical, uh, introduce the coming problems with Babylon. These problems don't really come up so much in chapter 38 as 39, but chapters 38 and 39 uh, talk about a later period in Hezekiah's life. It says in verse chapter 38, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. He was deadly, deathly sick. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. And said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. In the original, that wouldn't rhyme. It sounds like a poem here. I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add to thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I, and I will defend this city. Now, the sickness of Hezekiah uh, may have happened and probably did happen after the king of Assyria had departed. But simply God adds this note, though Assyria was still a, a power to be reckoned with and to be feared, he, he assures Hezekiah that he has nothing to fear from Assyria and they will be uh, perpetually safe from Assyria. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. Now, this is an interesting story. It has a lot of interesting features and I think that uh, it'll do us some good to look at them in, uh, individually. One of the features is, of course, that he was sick, uh, deathly sick, and yet he was healed. His, he, he was, his health was restored. Interestingly, he was apparently cured through a, an herbal cure that God showed Isaiah. It doesn't say so here, but at the end of the chapter it does. You see, chapter nine, uh, verses 9 through um, 20 is a song that Hezekiah sang celebrating his recovery. So we've just read the historical part. Then we have a song that Hezekiah sang and wrote in verses 9 through 20. Uh, yeah, 9 through 20. And then in verse 21 it says, For Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil. Apparently his sickness involved some boils, and he shall recover. So Hezekiah also had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Now, the events are re related in, an, in a strange order, because you would think that the mention of the lump of figs would be mentioned earlier before the song, and also the, the verse 22 it says he had asked for a sign Really, that should be mentioned between verses 6 and